Good morning, everyone. This remote meeting of the Climate and Energy Finance and Policy Committee is called to order, and the clerk will take the roll. Chair Long. Present. Vice Chair Aikum. Present. Minority Lead Swazinski. Present. Represent Bierman. Present. We represent Bo is joining. Representative Christensen. Present. Representative Franson. Representative Franson. Representative Grunhagen. Present. Franson present. Representative present. Franson present. Representative Grunhagen. Present. Representative Hollins. Present. Representative Hornstein. Present. Representative Igo. Igo present. Representative Lee. Lee, Lee present. Representative Lipperts. Lippert present. Representative Liz Lagarde. Liz Lagarde present. Representative Mecklin. Present. Representative Munson. Present. Representative Stevenson. Representative Stevenson. And Representative Bo. Uh, Representative Bo is present. We have a quorum members. Um, Representative Akam, have you had a chance to review the minutes from March 15th? I have, Mr. Chair, and I move approval. Representative Akam moves approval of the minutes from March 15th. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes are adopted. Uh, members, we have uh, two topics we'll be taking up today. The first is uh, clean fuels policies. We'll be Hearing first from the uh, administration on a stakeholder group that they convened, and then informationally hearing Representative Lippert's uh, revised bill. And then the second half of our hearing will be focused on uh, Commerce Department's supplemental uh, budget. So we will begin with a presentation from the administration, and we have uh, Tim Sexton, Assistant Commissioner of Department of Transportation, and Andrea Vobel, Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Agriculture. Uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. It's nice to be uh, in this committee. So thank you so much for having us. Um, I think my colleague is gonna share the PowerPoint. Awesome, there we go. Um, so again, for the record, my name is Andrea Bobel. I serve as uh, Deputy Commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And I'm here with my, my colleague, Tim Sexton. We're gonna um, tag team this, uh, this presentation. We're happy to... Um, answer questions after and we'll try and go quickly. I know you've got a lot on your agenda. So next slide. So one of the reasons um, that we're here today or what we're talking about is uh, a process that the governor asked us to, to, to work on um, together as these two agencies. The reason for that is because of a number of, of efforts that have happened previously. So some of you might be familiar with the Pathways to Decarbonate decarbonizing transportation paper that was released in 2019. Um, in, in that paper, it did talk about the need um, to meet our, our greenhouse gas emission goals of decarbonizing transportation, that, um, that biofuels and a clean fuel standard should be part of that. Um, we also convened the Governor's Council on Biofuels, which was a diverse council of Minnesota biofuels, interests, businesses, and nonprofits. That was in 2019 and 2020. Um, part of their recommendations was also to look at a, a clean fuel standard for Minnesota. Um, we are you. A lot of you are familiar also with the governor's climate change sub cabinet and um, the the climate change framework that they've been working on. That also mentions a clean fuel standard as well as the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council, which is um, a, a MnDOT led uh, group of community based organizations, nonprofits, public and private sector, and elected officials. So that led to um, the uh, oops. There we there we go clean fuels stakeholder engagement process, which we're here to talk about today. This started in October, 2021. And this is um, when Governor Walls directed MDA and MnDOT to engage a broad cross-section of stakeholders statewide to identify shared goals and opportunities to inform next steps for a clean fuel standard in Minnesota. So really quickly, what is a clean fuel standard? Um, it's it's a, a complicated and, and complex thing. So we're just gonna try and, and break it down um, into just some, some high level points. So it's a performance-based incentive program that reduces climate pollution from all fuels. So it's a, a fuel neutral that includes gas and diesel, that includes biofuels and electricity as we're talking uh, as a transportation fuel. Um, all of it is based on the life cycle carbon accounting from as we as they call it, um, uh, wheel to well. So the material extraction, the processing, the manufacturing, distribution, use, maintenance, and disposal of those fuels. 
Um, a carbon intensity score is assigned to all of fuels and um, any credits that are below um, the, the carbon intensity standard that is set, it generates credits. If fuels are above the standard, um, they generate deficits. Next slide. So some examples of how to reduce the carbon intensity score of a fuel, a refinery might do energy efficiency upgrades to their, to their process, um, do carbon, carbon capture from refining, an ethanol facility might use renewable natural gas to dry grains or caption carbon from fermentation tanks. An electric utility may deliver more renewable energy to EV charging customers. And a farmer might use car cover crops and no-till practices to reduce greenhouse gas losses or use more biodiesel in their heavy equipment. Next slide. So um, the, there's a low carbon fuel standard in uh, a number of states already. And so we thought it would be good to just paint the picture or, or set the landscape for where it is right now. So California has had a low carbon fuel standard since 2011. Oregon adopted it theirs in 2016 and Washington uh, just passed theirs in 2021. And they're currently working on, on building that framework. There's other states that are also considering or have legislation that's been proposed in their state legislatures in Colorado, New York, and New Mexico. New Mexico is um, probably uh, one of the closest to get it. It almost got over the finish line this last session of theirs. There is a history of looking at a clean fuel standard in the Midwest. Um, back in 2009, the um, Midwest Governors Association created the Midwestern Low Carbon Fuel Standard Work Group, chaired by Bill Northey, who was then the Iowa Ag Secretary and then later became USDA Undersecretary. Um, there's also a, a process some of you might be familiar with that was led by the Great Plains Institute back in 2020 of a clean fuels policy for the Midwest, and of course, the Future Fuels Act, uh, which you'll be hearing about more today. So um, one of the things, oh, sorry, uh, slide, just one slide back. So um, one of the things we thought was a, a really interesting slide that we've got, we worked, um, had a lot of conversations with uh, our counterparts in the state of Oregon about how their program has gone. And so since 2016, we wanted to point out some of the, the metrics they've, they've come across. So they've reduced about 5.3 million tons of greenhouse gases on a life cycle basis. Uh, they've lowered the carbon intensity of, of the carbon intensity score of ethanol and biodiesel by about 20% and they've increased the blend rate of biodiesel and renewable diesel to about 13%. They also enabled the state's utilities to invest almost $20 million in um, EV projects. Next slide. Um, another reason we wanted to, to look at the, the this clean fuel standard for Minnesota particularly, and what's, what's nice about something like the clean fuel standard is it can be designed by Minnesotans for Minnesotans. So it's something that we can really tailor to the unique needs of our state and the economy that we have compared to a lot of the other states that already have it. Um, it also has um, shares a lot of the goals and, and co-benefits that we all we all celebrate here in Minnesota. Um, cleaner water and soil health uh, can build on some of the existing programs that some of you might be aware of. Um, one like the Forever Green, with a lot of the um, winter annuals uh, opportunities that exist with some of those emerging crops. Also, um, farmers are very familiar with the, our Minnesota Ag Water Quality Certification Program, uh, which encourages a lot of BMPs that could be helpful in the the. Um, the creation of the, the CI score um, when, when creating biofuels or alternative fuels. And then improve equity with the air quality and public health benefits that um, decarbonizing the transportation sector could provide. With that, I will kick it over to you, Tim. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. And uh, for the record, my name is Tim Sexton. I serve as uh, an assistant commissioner with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. And also want to apologize for the, the back and forth um, still working out some kinks and using zoom so that was on me um a little bit about the process though that we went through uh to, to in order to get feedback and really the idea as as mentioned was really to to understand what people are thinking about the clean fuels process what are their goals you know is there are there some sort of shared themes um principles kind of common goals that we could identify across different stakeholder groups um, and at the same time, while a lot of work had been done in the past already uh, around this idea of a clean fuel standard in Minnesota, there were some groups that maybe had less exposure. So, you know, we also wanted to build this understanding about uh, what a clean fuel, fuel standard could be and could look like in Minnesota, as, as mentioned by Deputy Commissioner Bobble, the, um, you know, it is, it can be sort of a, a complex policy. And so building that understanding is really important. When we talk about the stakeholder groups, you can see here on the right hand side, the, the groups that we, we coordinated with um, in a series of a series of meetings. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but um, just want to make sure we highlight the different <clears throat> stakeholder groups, stakeholders that we did collaborate with on this process. 
Um, and then, you know, really the intended outcome um, of this entire effort was really a summary paper to say, what are some of those shared priorities? You know, what, what are some areas where there might be more uh, need for exploration, research, um, you know, expanded understanding? And so that's what we've, we've done um, in this report that was just uh, shared with stakeholders today and will be released more formally later this week. So, um, you know, I mentioned this process. We had really eight groups of stakeholders, one of which we included sort of the public. We did hold a series of public meetings, um, 33 total meetings between October and January, um, you know, over 470 participants in those meetings. Um, you know, we really started by trying to build up that level of base understanding one around how a CFS could work um, and has worked in other places um, before really kind of turning it over, or at least our attempt was to turn over the agendas for subsequent meetings to the stakeholders themselves based on feedback we heard or questions that they were asking. And so we are really grateful also for everyone who participated, but also for the groups um, you know, who were able to join and spend some time preparing presentations and answering questions, both, you know, for example, how different businesses are viewing a clean fuel standard or how these have uh, worked in other states. So some of the common themes that, um, you know, that, that we heard will say that, you know, in addition to those public or excuse me, the, the sort of the, in, the virtual meetings that we hosted, we also received a lot of written feedback from folks. Um, and so we try to put all that together to really identify some areas, you know, that people seem to be sharing and that this wasn't universal, but these are, you know, themes that we heard from more than one person and more than one group. So we tried to identify, you know, kind of the, the top 10 of those for this group today. You know, one is there's still, still some questions about the complexity of a policy like this. Um, you know, there was general recognition that uh, this is really the single, potentially the single biggest policy lever the state can take to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. Um, and that is an important note that was, I think, important to a lot of people to emphasize in, in terms of why they were supportive, recognizing that, you know, 20 to 50% of reduction of emissions from this sector could be reduced through a policy like this. And it's really what that lever looks like would be part of the policy design. The other themes were around, you know, really making sure that this is fuel neutral, um, science-based, so that all fuels as much as possible would have a level playing field so that they could compete and that the government isn't picking winners here. This is really driven by science and data. Um, ensuring equity um, is in considered and really prioritized. Um, using data and tools to evaluate that uh, was a common theme. Um, along with this being not a standalone, despite the, you know, the high potential to reduce climate pollution, it shouldn't be the only strategy. Um, and the focus on fuels was important, but we should also be looking at opportunities to make vehicles more efficient, to think about how we're addressing vehicle miles traveled and other opportunities for transportation options, safety, et cetera, is all part of a suite of a sort of a comprehensive climate package. There should be off ramps. So if there's a policy like this isn't working, like there should be a mechanism to allow for a pause or a reevaluation. This is in place in other states. And I think there was a lot of support for that within Minnesota too. Um, you know, really focusing on co-benefits. This is while climate might be driving this, um, making sure that we're focusing on jobs, um, business opportunities, natural environment, and again, um, ensuring that disadvantaged communities are at the table in designing and benefiting from a policy like this. Um, really a focus on performance versus volumetric standards. Um, learning from other states, while not replicating or just taking their policies and applying them here, but learning from their best practices and avoiding their missteps. Um, you know, this transition piece and the timing was also really important to a lot of people. Like that sort of ambition is important, but making sure that there's a, a sort of a time to ramp up as um, jobs and businesses would transition towards a lower carbon uh, fuel economy. Um, and then a lot of just desire for more, more engagement on this. So while there's a lot of enthusiasm amongst a number of different stakeholder groups, I think that we also heard that there was still quite a few questions um, that people hope to answer, which leads us to sort of like 
the further exploration piece. Um, and this is the last slide before we get into next steps. You know, we heard desire for more information on costs and benefits as this relates to fuel producers, fuel wholesalers, and consumers. Um, support, like how do how could a policy like this be designed to really emphasize co-benefits for the environment and for disadvantaged communities? Um, a bit more sort of formal documentation of how CFS policies have worked in other places, understanding some of those lesson learned, lessons learned and some, you know, maybe in some case studies. A lot of interest around indirect land use. And so this is and really around if we're if there is a way to promote by if this a policy like this would promote biofuels, how are there, how could that policy also help to avoid impacts to native forests, grasslands, and prairies? Um, under, more understanding about this sort of credit system and the mechanisms and oversight, who would lead a policy like this so and sort of what that process would look like other states have had authorizing legislation which led to rulemaking which led to a state agency or agency equivalent kind of overseeing this process so there's questions about the best sort of the best approach here in minnesota and there are different opinions about that um, how to deal with areas like sustainable aviation fuel or saf where there's a lot of interest from the industry, but supplies are still kind of uh, low, although growing. Um, and then, you know, potential economic impact, economic development opportunities. So how, how could we really leverage this to be a leader, both in the state and in the region and in the country to grow jobs and businesses and support rural economic development within Minnesota? So last slide is just on the next steps. You know, like I said, we heard a lot of common themes and a lot of common commonality. We also heard some areas uh, where there were still some questions. Uh, and so the way we were thinking about this uh, in terms of next steps that we will propose is one, a lot of interest still in Minnesota leading, but understanding sort of what it would a regional approach look like, not necessarily a regional clean fuels program where everyone is aligned, um, or has the same program that's adopted, but maybe there's some shared goals, principles, approach across states within the Midwest. So we're proposing a convening um, this summer or fall to bring other state agency folks from Midwest states together to, to advance this conversation. And then also, as I mentioned, a lot of questions. And so we're proposing some additional research uh, in these areas and perhaps some others to really build that understanding uh, and the information that was requested by a lot of groups. So that's all we had today, uh, Chair. I'd be happy to turn it over to you if there's time for questions or late, um, but that's the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, we do just have a few minutes for questions and then we'll have to keep moving and we'll take some questions as well on Representative Lippert's bill. Uh, first, Representative Swasinski. Thank you, um, uh, Chair Long. And then uh, to, to Mr. Uh, Sexton from the Sexton, yeah, thank you. Um, Mr. Sexton, um, you talked a little bit about um, that people are very enthusiastic the bill and then um, refer to folks that don't support the bill as having questions. Um, do, you, do you feel like that's an accurate uh, account or do you feel like people might actually just have opposition to your bill or the idea? Mr. Sexton. Chair Long and Representative Sosinski, um, you know, we had a, we had a range of responses. Um, I, I think it, I think it is fair though in terms of your my understanding of your question around sort of opposition or questions. Um, I would say in the large part, the folks that um, maybe were not clearly supporting um, at you know that uh, were were really open to the idea of exploring what these opportunities could look like. And I don't want to mischaracterize any of the comments, so I'm, I'm trying to be careful here, but we didn't hear a lot of groups, uh, at least we didn't receive feedback from, from many groups that said, no, this is a bad idea and there is no path forward. So I do think it is, a, in my opinion, a fair characterization that sort of the folks who were maybe not outright supportive of something like this really did have questions and wanted to learn more before establishing a, a position. But I would also ask Deputy Commissioner Bobble, do you have any anything to add to that? Sounds like she's good with your answer. Uh, <laughs> we have about five minutes uh, left, Representative Swazinski. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just, you know, another general question as we're talking about this kind of uh, what kind of uh, cost increase is the department comfortable with um, as this potentially moves forward? Because obviously, if you create a carbon, a carbon account, that money comes from someplace. It just doesn't come out of magic air. It comes from, you know, consumers' pockets and, and other places. You know, what, what kind of a goal do you have as far as increases and what, are, what do you think the department will be comfortable with? Mr. Sexton. Yeah, thank you, Chair Long and, and Representative. I would also just welcome my, my co-presenter to jump in here too at any point. Um, you know, we actually heard some really interesting feedback from the state of Oregon on the question of costs. Um, you know, Oregon and a number of others, and a couple of others, I think believe Washington also has some off ramps built in, in case costs do increase too much. Um, but actually what we heard from Oregon was that in some cases, costs actually went down for some higher biofuel blends. Um, and that overall costs were, were very low and that different providers had different ways of meeting the, um, the CI scores that were required as part of this program. Um, and that sort of worst case, I believe, was three or three to five cents um, cost increase for providers who were not able to trade informally to get those uh, lower carbon credits. So I think the key message that we heard is that actually in some cases with higher biofuel blends, I believe it was around B10, uh, costs actually went down overall, but we'd be happy to provide more data or information on that if, if, if interested. Uh, Representative Susinski, did you have a, one more question? Yeah, just and, and then you mentioned quite a bit about uh, about the, the temperature and the environment and how people are excited about what this will do. Exactly how much cooler will the environment be if we pass this um, in Minnesota? Um, when Mr. Sexton, would you like to take that? Um, yeah, thanks, Chair Long and, and Representative Sosinski. I, I, I wonder if you could maybe help me understand that question. I, I'm not sure I fully understand. I think, I think uh, Representative Sosinski is asking, what will this do for uh, addressing climate change? Uh, as far as temperature. You. Mr. Sexton. Yeah, so global temperature uh, associated with climate change impacts is a, it's really, it's a, that's a global issue, but in terms of our state contribution and, you know, achieving the goals that are in state law, um, you know, with the next generation energy act is really what's been driving sort of our approach to this issue is, um, you know, a policy like this is flexible. Other states have had, you know, targeted reductions around 20 to 30%. Um, you know, this really though has the flexibility to be even more ambitious. So I would say that, you know, we really are viewing this as sort of like 20 to 50% of reduction of transportation emissions could potentially be reduced um, through this policy and sort of associated investments that would come along with it. Uh, Representative Igel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so my question is for Mr. Sexton as well. Um, it relates to your last slide. So just so I understand, when you were talking about there are some things that haven't been explored yet, you know, three things stuck out to me, fuel prices, jobs, and rural economic development. So you talked a little in your presentation, but so you think there hasn't been adequate research done to how this could affect those three industries, correct? Uh, Mr. Sexton. Yeah, Chair Long and Representative Igo. Um, I, I don't know if I would say adequate or not, but I think there were more, there were definitely questions about more under better understanding about what has been done and maybe some of the outstanding questions on those three topics yes representative Igo. thank you so i think that outlines right now that this this idea and this proposal is being a little bit rushed because if you ask me those three things of fuel prices jobs and rural economic development should be front of mind when we're talking about a standard like this for the state of minnesota that is has metro and greater so i think the department has a lot more work to do before we consider adopting a fuel standard like this thank you uh so Representative Beerman, Representative Franzen, I'm going to put you at the top of the list for questions after we, we hear from the, the bill presenter, because we unfortunately are out of time for this segment. Um, we what a are, shocker. 
We're going to move to uh, House File 2083, um, Representative Lippert. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, uh, Mr. Sexton and Ms. Vobble. Um, so Representative Lippert, this will be an informational hearing and we posted a uh, DE uh, to your bill, House File 2083. Would you care to make some opening comments before we turn to testimony? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Last year, we heard the Future Fuels Act, a bill that would establish a clean fuel standard for Minnesota for the sake of reducing greenhouse gas emissions of transportation fuels and to help us make progress towards our climate goals. And I want, also want to thank Deputy Commissioner Vauble and Assistant Commissioner Sexton for the work they've done this last year in convening a wide range of conversations on this policy. And they've also been generous in helping me connect with officials for deeper conversations in states that currently have a CFS and British Columbia too. And in the conversations I've had, I've heard a few key themes. First, the CFS is a key climate policy in these states and in British Columbia. Not the only climate policy or the only one for transportation, but a key policy. And these states and British Columbia are seeing significant results. So in the conversations I was able to have, uh, in California, utility officials spoke to how the policy is driving electrification. Currently, electricity makes up 22% of the transportation fuel market in California. And the officials noted that the clean fuel standard has been a key part in this transition. In British Columbia, the CFS is their primary policy for emissions reduction in the transportation sector. They have an aggressive electric vehicle goal as well. 100% of all vehicles sold by 2030 will be electric in British Columbia, but they still project that their CFS will be responsible for the majority of emissions reduction after 2030. Oregon project, projects a 37% reduction in transportation emissions by 2035 because of the results of their recently implemented CFS. Another theme I heard was innovation. Oregon's directing, directing $10 million of revenue and credits per year to electric school buses, EV charging, and other pilot projects for electrification. A Washington legislator spoke about efforts to turn fryer oil to fuel, closing up a waste stream. Representative Grunhagen, you'll appreciate that California is seeing good progress on addressing methane emissions through their clean fuel standard. And we need a policy that can help us address, address methane emissions in Minnesota too. We have to do this work carefully, but this policy can be a helpful tool. As I've been speaking with environmental groups in this last year, I also heard some concerns with the bill as it was constructed. And those conversations led to the DE that's posted today. So these are the main changes in the DE. First, the emissions reduction goal is more aggressive. The goals are now 25% emissions reduction below the 2018 baseline level by 2030, 75% reduction by 2040, and 100% emissions reduction in transportation fuels by 2050. Second, carbon capture and underground storage of carbon dioxide for enhanced oil recovery is prohibited from generating, credit, from generating credits. Third, to address the concern of land use change, this DE prohibits generating credits from land that doesn't have a five-year cropping history. Fourth, there's also a credit premium added into this version. One of the opportunities we have in creating a Minnesota version of a clean fuel standard is to value soil health practices and continuous living cover crops that provide other ecosystem benefits, clean water, soil health, erosion prevention, and some of these practices and crops sequester carbon too. So this bill provides a 10% credit premium for cropland derived biofuels from continuous living cover crops like pennycress and winter camelina, and a 5% credit premium for cropland derived biofuels that integrate soil healthy farming practices like cover crops and conservation tillage. Fifth, it requires that the revenue earned by a utility from the sale of credits resulting from the utilities generation of electricity must go towards the adoption of electric vehicles through electric vehicle charging infrastructure, rebates to, per, uh, to people who purchase electric vehicles, promotion of EVs and more, and an equity goal as a principle in the policy as a whole. We want to focus improvements in air quality, for instance, for communities of color and people with low incomes who need that improvement the most. And finally, there's an advisory committee to the rulemaking process that has broad representation. So that's an overview of the DE, Mr. Chair. And there's a lineup of testifiers with me, and I'll turn to them now. Thank you so much, Representative Lippert. Uh, we have an, a number of testifiers, and so since we have a full agenda today, we're going to ask that everybody 
Please keep your uh, testimony to two minutes each. And we will begin with uh, Dr. Jeremy Martin. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Yes, uh, Chair Long and members of the committee, I'm Jeremy Martin, Director of Fuels Policy and Senior Scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists. On behalf of our 6,800 uh, plus supporters in Minnesota, we strongly support the Future Fuels Act. Uh, UCS has been engaged for several years with a broad coalition of stakeholders to develop uh, this kind of science-based policy framework to support clean fuels based on their full life cycle emissions. Uh, this approach ensures that all actors in the supply chain are doing their part to clean up, to, to clean up transportation uh, from EVs to biofuels. We support the Future Fuels Act because it will accelerate electric vehicle deployment, it will ensure biofuel production keeps improving, and it will support farmers that act to reduce emissions while growing crops for biofuels. I'll focus briefly just on uh, one of the transportation electrification elements. Uh, this is a high priority for, for my organization and for the, and, and of course, replacing internal combustion engines with electric vehicles is a primary strategy to phase out petroleum over the next several decades. The Future Fuels Act is designed to support transportation electrification and can complement other policies that regulate uh, vehicle producers, utilities, and fleet operators. Just consider for an example a, a transit agency. Uh, we know that investments in high-quality public transit, such as bus rapid transit, are critical to reducing oil use, making our cities and towns more livable, and ensuring equitable access to mobility for everyone. We also know that electrifying buses is a high priority to reduce exposure to diesel pollution in communities that live in close proximity to transit routes. The Future Fuels Act provides substantial support for bus electrification. Uh, credits generated by a single electric bus could be worth $10,000 a year. And, and this support for electrification ensures that transit agencies don't have to decide between increasing mobility and reducing pollution, but can instead move forward on both together. Uh, the Future Fuels Act is not a, you know, a silver bullet, uh, but a well-designed Future Fuels Act can complement and strengthen uh, other policies, all of them acting together to accelerate the path to a cleaner Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, next, we'll hear from M.K. Anderson. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning. My name is M.K. Anderson, and I'm here on behalf of Fresh Energy. Fresh Energy is a nearly 30-year-old Minnesota-based, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that is working to achieve equitable carbon neutral economies. We appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today regarding House File 2083, or the Future Fuels Act, which would establish a clean fuel standard in Minnesota. So Minnesota has made really great progress in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions from the power sector, but we have fallen behind in making similar progress in other sectors, such as transportation. Transportation is now the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in Minnesota. Reducing emissions from the transportation sector is critical to meeting Minnesota's climate goals. Establishing a clean fuel standard for the, through the Future Fuels Act is one strategy that Fresh Energy supports for tackling this critical problem. Fresh Energy supports House File 2083 and has appreciated the opportunity to engage with a wide range of stakeholders on this topic. A clean fuel standard is an important tool in the toolbox to help speed decarbonization of the transportation sector by making market-based incentives for cleaner fuels. The carbon intensity schedule laid out in the bill will help ensure emissions associated with transportation decrease over time while speeding the transition to lower emission vehicles. Establishing the Future Fuels Act would make Minnesota the first state in our region to adopt a clean fuels policy. In addition to the emissions reductions and public health benefits from reduced tailpipe emissions, taking a leadership role on this issue will send a market signal that Minnesota is ready to do business with companies that are driving innovation in clean transportation technologies, making this a real win-win for Minnesota. As the bill progresses, one area we believe warrants additional discussion is the question of which agencies should be delegated to lead this rulemaking process. Fresh Energy's belief is that the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has the right expertise in greenhouse gas emission assessment and modeling, and is likely in the best position to run this type of complex rulemaking process. In conclusion, Fresh Energy recognizes the need for and supports the establishment of a Minnesota clean fuels policy under the guidelines laid out in House File 2083. And we look forward to continued dialogue on this topic. We appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Dan Bowerson. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair Long, Vice Chair Tom, Minority Leader, Committee members. On behalf of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation or Auto Innovators, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of the Future Fuels Act. This legislation not only supports electric vehicles, but can also reduce emissions from every vehicle on the road. 
I'm Dan Bowerson, Senior Director of Energy and Environment Policy with the Association, representing car companies that produce over 97% of new vehicles sold in Minnesota last year. Automakers are committed to developing, producing, and promoting electric vehicles with over 60 models available today and at least 130 different models by 2026. The auto industry is fully committed to this electric future and will invest over $330 billion in electric vehicles by 2023. However, for this transition to be successful, increasing customer demand is necessary. And time and time again, studies show that purchase price and available charging and refueling infrastructure are key to doing so. A clean fuel standard can promote both of these. In the context of climate change, market-based mechanisms are widely understood to encourage emissions reductions in the most efficient way, especially when broadly applied. The Future Fuels Act will reduce the carbon intensity of gasoline and diesel either directly or by funding low carbon intense alternatives, such as plug-in and fuel cell electric vehicles, and the required infrastructure to support the use of these vehicles. The Future Fuels Act is an important part of Minnesota's overall strategy to reduce transportation emitting carbon emissions, providing an approach that aligns improved fuel economy with lower emission fuels. It can also provide a source of revenue for transportation-related investments and improvements. Minnesota has set ambitious vehicle electrification goals with the adoption of the Clean Car Regulations starting in model year 2025. The Future Fuels Act is a perfect example of a complementary policy to help address necessary conditions to meet the state's goals. Therefore, we encourage the committee to pass the Future Fuels Act. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify at the hearing today. As I mentioned, this type of policy is an important uh, step to decarbonize the transportation sector. And we look forward to working with Minnesota and other stakeholders to make sure this is a success. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we'll hear from Luca Zulo. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, to address the committee. Uh, URI, the Agriculture Utilization Research Institute, is a strong proponent of biofuel and biofuel policy, and as such, we support the Future Fuel Act. We see biofuels as essential contributors to climate change mitigation and reversal, and as a powerful enabler for rural economic and technological development. Minnesota has a tradition of leadership in this area. Its early adoption of ethanol and biodiesel blending mandates has ensured robust growth in this sector to the benefits of farmers and farming community alike. Today, I would like to highlight the importance of this bill to expand the scope and definition of potential biofuels. In particular, we believe that in conjunction with the Natural Gas Innovation Act, this bill will be essential to establishing a vibrant and innovative biogas and renewable natural gas industry in the state. Anaerobic digestion, the process of transforming organic waste into biogas suitable for further processing into renewable gas is a well-known established technology. In the last few years, the United States has seen a resurgence interest in biogas development. This bill would dramatically accelerate the deployment of rural biogas assets and foster the combined exploitation of agricultural, industrial, and residential organic waste, thus creating new economic opportunities for rural and semi-rural communities. We look forward to the opportunity for smaller farming operations to benefit from establishing a viable biogas industry. Small farming operations are often left behind the current business models. Once generated, the Natural Gas Innovation Act provision allowed the renewable natural gas to be locally distributed using the existing pipeline infrastructure to a variety of users, including public and private-owned fleet operators. Some of these fleet operators have already switched from diesel to natural gas and thus can immediately benefit from the use of renewable natural gas as soon as it becomes available. Lastly, I would like to conclude the testimony by addressing another sector of the oil field of the biofuel industry that can significantly benefit Minnesota farmers, Sustainable Aviation Fuel, or SAF. The state already hosts a leading activity pioneering the output to jet fuel technology. This is a trend our ethanol industry is keen to adopt. The other market-ready technology to synthesize SAF involves the conversion of vegetable oils. I do not need to stress the role of crops such as soy in, in the state economy. With the University of Minnesota, URI is involved in the Forever Green Initiative, which among the others is developing oleaginous crops such as Camelina penicris. These crops are eminently suitable for SAF production as an abundant, economical, environmental, viable, and valuable feedstock. We believe this bill would dramatically accelerate the commercial de deployment of these crops and be essential in making the state a leader in the SAF development and commercialization. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Steve Morris. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Hey, 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Morris. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Environmental Partnership with the state's largest coalition of environmental and conservation organizations. Um, I was a member of the governor's clean fuels task force that was discussed earlier in this meeting. And as a result of this, this, uh, these discussions, numerous organizations collaborated to develop some key principles that our community feels are important components of any low carbon fuel standard. These were, were provided to the stakeholders process on January 5th and are included in your committee packet. I wanted to highlight one area of concern. With the multiple environmental challenges that we as a state and a society face today, we cannot afford to trade off gains on one issue for, for, for further damage for another. Specifically, we cannot adopt policies that have a modest impact on climate emissions while locking in and adding to the severe problems we face with degraded surface and groundwaters. The PCA now lists more than 6,000 polluted waters in our state. It is critical that any program to incentivize low carbon fuels also protect and promote improvements on how, where, and what biofuels are grown. I want to extend my deep appreciation to Representative Lippert and Chair Long for taking the time to consider the concerns raised and engaging in a thoughtful conversation and working to resolve and respond to these voices. The delete all amendment that was put before you today, is, today makes dramatic improvements on the original bill and responds to the many issues that were raised. We believe that a low carbon fuel policy can be a valuable tool in reducing emissions for the transportation sector. On a high level, if we craft a policy that over the short and the long term puts us on a clear path to reach internationally recognized science-based greenhouse gas reduction goals, while incentivizing and promoting the electrification of our entire fleet and jumpstarting the use of low carbon biofuels derived, derived from water and soil friendly crops, continuous living cover crops, that is a good thing. With this amendment, we feel we are well on our way to this goal. Lastly, let me say that we believe there's an area that still calls out for some work and analysis. Although the scientific imperative calls for a 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, the amendment before you calls for a 25% reduction, reduction at this time. We are uncertain what the best number should be for this initial benchmark. Our goal is to have this number be as close as possible to the international standards while recognizing the legit legitimate constraints in getting there. This number should consider the constantly changing and developing momentum for rapid electrification of the transportation sector. We also, need a, we also need a credible assessment of how high this number can be. What is the stretch goal for future providers, fuel providers, and auto manufacturers? And how fast can we adopt some of the low carbon water friendly biocrops we've been talking about? We thank Representative Lippert, Lippert for moving this policy forward. We think it can be a beneficial step for our climate and for our land and for opening up the discussion to more voices. Today's amendment is a dramatic step forward and we, can, we, we look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Uh, next, we'll hear from Maddie Johnson. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Long, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak regarding Hertz File 2083. Uh, I'm Maddie Johnson. I'm a clean transportation organizer with Minnesota 350, an organization representing over 30,000 climate justice concerned Minnesotans. A clean fuel standard has the potential to be a useful tool if it's one part of a comprehensive suite of policies meant to get us towards net zero transportation. If it sets an aggressive 2030 benchmark to get us to 100% carbon neutral by 2050, and if it adequately assesses the total social cost of all fuel types. Clean fuel standards treat all fuel types as neutral, but they are not equal. Electric vehicles, or EVs, are unequivocally the best technology for reaching carbon neutral transportation while creating numerous co-benefits, including reduced deaths due to air pollution. In 95% of countries, we can see that EVs are better for the climate than internal combustion vehicles, no matter the local electric grid makeup or fuel type. Most arguments against electrification are based on misunderstanding the technology. Uh, cold weather countries are actually championing EV adoption. Uh, when I asked local EV manufacturer Zeus Electric Chassis, uh, what their barriers were around cold weather and range, they said, just tell us what you need and we'll design the vehicle. That's how capable the technology is and it's only improving over time. On top of this, owners of light, medium and heavy duty EVs benefit from saving on fuel and maintenance costs. 
Vehicle to grid technology means large batteries can support our electric grid during blackouts or peak hours. Prices and availability of food and fossil fuels are already unstable right now, both due to war and to climate change. This makes electric vehicles a method of fueling that has numerous co-benefits and makes it the most safe, stable investment for Minnesota. In summation, we appreciate the progress and work around this, and the amendments put forward by Rep. Lippert do significantly uh, increase the viability of this bill. However, we cannot endorse this policy at present. We need to see Minnesota advance on a large clean transportation policy suite, which includes transition towards electric vehicles, building out land use policies, reducing vehicle miles traveled, and providing steady investment to transit, bike, and walk. This has the start of a good conversation, but we need to make sure that we are adequately addressing the air, climate, and economic impacts of all the fuel types, which will be examined under a clean fuel standard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Colin Curitan. Mr. Chair and members, my name is Colin Curitan, and I work as the Director of Adoption and Scaling for the University of Minnesota's Forever Green Initiative. Thank you for the opportunity to provide perspective on the Future Fuels Act. Uh, while many judge this bill in how it could affect the future of traditional biofuels or electric vehicles, I would like to focus my comments on the feedstocks and low-carbon fuels that this policy could accelerate to advance the interests of Minnesota's agricultural productivity, rural economic development, natural resource stewardship, and climate resilience. Forever Green is developing the winter hardy oil seeds, winter camelina, and pennycress that could be major players in the future of Minnesota and Midwest biofuels, especially renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuels, two fuels that are sure to be around for several decades longer than ethanol blended gasoline for light duty vehicles. Pennycress and winter camelina are being developed as fall planted cash cover crops that enhance but do not replace current cropping systems. These crops can serve as the third path in biofuels around which our state's agricultural, rural economic development, and environmental interests rally. If responsibly constructed, the Future Fuels Act could expedite their rollout. Why will the Future Fuels Act be a major lever for the winter oil seeds? Biofuels, biofuels made from camelina and pennycress are ultra low carbon fuels. Initial carbon intensity scores for these, crop, for these two crops are 40 to 80% lower than traditional ethanol and biodiesel. By growing these crops in the shoulder season, their land use change score is zero or close to it. This is a major advantage giving, given that land use for ethanol and biodiesel account for over half their total carbon intensity. In other words, the winter oil seeds overcome the long running food versus fuel debate in agriculturally derived biofuels. Of the thousand plus approved feedstock pathways in California's low carbon fuels market, the CI scores of Camelina and Petticrest are lower than 80 to 90% of all other feedstock pathways. Drop-in equivalent fuels made from Camelina and Pennycrest would compete very well in the type of credit market that would be created by the Future Fuels Act. Uh, the result would be careful, the careful process of reducing production of carbon-intense fuels like oil, oil and gas, accelerating the market-driven, profitable cover crop adoption across Minnesota. Simply put, the Future Fuels Act could be the single largest policy lever, lever for sustainable, market-driven scaling of cover crops in Minnesota's history. I repeat, this act could be the largest ever policy level lever for scaling cover crops in Minnesota's history. Notably, scaling the winter oil seeds would address the concerns of the agricultural community for a greater demand for agricultural products and farm profitability and address the environmental community's concern for a steeper CI reduction target, support for continuous living cover and soil healthy farming practices, and expanding clean energy to mean supporting water quality and habitat. These crops and their market opportunity are real. Several thousand acres of Pennycrest are undergoing commercial launch in the southern Midwest, utilizing U of M developed and owned Pennycrest traits. In the western U.S., over 100,000 acres of Camelina are being planted via several major industry partnerships. Every week, energy companies across the U.S. call me asking to source truckloads of these feedstocks. I tell them not yet, but soon. Um, importantly, and uh, uh, lastly, in order for the, uh, this policy to accurately reflect the low carbon benefits of Pennycrest and Camelina and support their scaling, emissions associated with land use and land use change must be accounted for in this policy, as they often account for over 50% of agricultural feedstocks carbon intensity. Uh, responsible lawmakers and concerned advocates would be wise to consider the major important role that these winter oil seeds have for the future fuels of Minnesota and how this policy could advance the goal of a low carbon Minnesota. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Peter Wagenius. Please introduce yourself and proceed. I'm Peter Wagenius, Legislative Director at Sierra Club. Last year, Sierra Club testified our concerns about this bill, and while we're still not able to endorse it, we very much appreciate Representative Lippert for raising the bar on what a good low-carbon fuel standard could be. 
What kind of standard the administration will advance is a fraught question, because a bad standard would not just be ineffective, but could actually drag us backwards, throwing an economic lifeline to the outdated ethanol industry without seriously incentivizing vehicle electrification. As I noted last year, technology and the free market are leaving ethanol behind. A bad standard is precisely what some folks want because big oil and big ag have a shared incentive to slow electrification because you can't put any liquid fuel into an EV. So in January, our coalition reiterated opposition to the proposed E15 mandate, and the standard must not be used to achieve the same subsidy through the side door. So we applaud Representative Lippert for designating commerce as lead agency, not ag. The most critical provision is the is the first benchmark for reduced carbon intensity. And some have said that EVs can't ramp up fast enough, but we're not passive observers. The state could pass other legislation supporting EV adoption, making it possible to aim higher, which is why the standard must not be thought of as a miracle cure. Finally, advocates have acknowledged that the administration's likely standard would incentivize the CO2 pipeline network coming out of Nebraska and Iowa into Minnesota and the Dakotas. Please read the written testimony from Cure and, re and learn about the ever-expanding bipartisan opposition. Just last Thursday, conservative Iowa farmers successfully pushed the Iowa House to pass a moratorium on the use of imminent domain for those pipelines. The CO2 in those pipelines could easily be used for enhanced oil recovery in the Dakotas. If those locally unwanted pipelines are actually built, would Minnesota even have the power to prevent that CO2 from being used for EOR? Isn't that why the Dakotas are the target? Because at that point, we couldn't stop it? As we consider a standard, we must factor in these downstream economic incentives as much as the downstream effects on water quality and climate. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Uh, and last, we will hear from Brendan Jordan. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Lippert. Uh, my name is Brendan Jordan. I uh, lead transportation and fuel programs at the Great Plains Institute and facilitate the Future Fuels Coalition. The Future Fuels Coalition is a, a broad-based uh, coalition that has worked to support a clean fuel standard for Minnesota. Uh, I would like to offer a huge thank you to Representative Lippert and to the various organizations that have been in dialogue uh, to to uh, develop uh, the amendment uh, that's before the committee today. Uh, I want to assure, assure everybody that the Future Fuels Coalition shares your interest in assuring a program that benefits water quality, uh, that benefits climate smart agricultural practices, that sets the most ambitious greenhouse gas target possible, and addresses transportation equity in Minnesota. Uh, we look forward to working with all of you to pass an effective, strong clean fuel standard for Minnesota. Uh, I want to address a, a few issues that were raised uh, in the discussion today. First of all, air quality. Uh, we know that communities of color, uh, low income Minnesotans, Minnesotans with disabilities are disproportionately burdened by air pollution from our current system, from burning petroleum. Uh, the, in collaboration with the Holloway Group at the University of Wisconsin, we studied the impact of a clean fuel standard and found that it would lower SOX, NOx, and PM 2.5 with greater benefits near highways, uh, disproportionately benefiting those overburdened communities and leading to up to $35 million per year in health benefits. A clean fuel standard would have both rural and uh, urban economic impacts for Minnesota, leading to a billion dollars in, in increased annual economic output and 1,500 jobs, uh, according to ICF. Finally, uh, it is good for consumers. A uh, clean fuel standard offers net economic benefits for fuel consumers. And uh, according to recent analysis by Bates White Consulting, the California low carbon fuel standard uh, had no impact whatsoever on retail fuel prices. In fact, retail fuel prices were completely uncorrelated with California credit prices. Uh, wrapping up my comments, and I'm a couple seconds over, my apologies, but I think it's important that we, we not lose track of the burdens and costs of our current system. We, we have an over-reliance on one fuel. Uh, consumers benefit from having choices. And a clean fuel standard would create more choices for Minnesota, uh, leaving us less vulnerable to petroleum price spikes, health burdens, uh, and lack of investment in, in domestic clean fuel alternatives. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Lippert. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. We have a hard stop at 1130 to turn to uh, the Department of Commerce. And we'll begin with the two members I promised uh, last time would start, Representative Bierman and then Representative France. Uh, Representative Bierman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to go back to the uh, comments of um, Mr. Sexton and Ms. Vaubel regarding the other states that have done this already. And I just wanted to learn more about any other data points that they wanted to point us toward. Mr. Sexton did mention lower some lower prices in Oregon and uh, Representative Lippert in his introduction um, mentioned methane reduction. Uh, the CFS will accelerate and reduce greenhouse gases and, and uh, increase electrification, all good points. I su uh, assume that's the um, objectives here, but just wondered if they could share any other data points that they have seen in their research. Representative Lippert. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I don't know if um, uh, Deputy Commissioner Bobble is still still online. Um, you know, I think the one thing that we heard, I heard very strongly was just the, the difference that um, the clean fuel standard is making in methane reduction in California and that um, there's uh, just strong credit incentive and uh, we really with with the standard and we we really need to be reducing uh, methane emissions is one of the primary thing we can do to stop warming right now um, so that's of great interest to me um, i don't have um, more hard data on that but uh, officials in california were very very encouraged thank you mr thank chair i'm um, just just one other question i wanted to understand the uh, fuels and how they are me measured and tested and who would be the testing? Is it is it um, determined yet how that process would work in the new bill? Representative Lippert. Might defer to Brennan Jordan on that question. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the bill calls for uh, the Argonne National Laboratory's uh, so-called GREET model. Uh, GREET is an acronym. Um, this is um, more or less the industry standard tool for doing what's called full life cycle assessment of fuels. So it takes into account uh, greenhouse gas emissions throughout the entire production and use process. Um, there would be, uh, according to the amendment, uh, some, some ability for uh, customizing that for Minnesota um, and taking into account uh, new science, uh, although the, the uh, Argonne team does work very hard to incorporate um, you know, new literature, new scientific literature and adjust, uh, the tool, um, there would be room for Minnesota to, you know, take into account current research as well. Thank you. Mr. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Bierman. Uh, Representative Franson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. For a while there, I thought maybe I'm, uh, you know, in Russia because this has just been one infomercial of propaganda. Uh, you know, those that had opposing views were told that there was going to be no public testimony and that they could send in letters. Mr. Chair, this is what you would see in a banana republic. Um, this is a sham of a hearing. Once again, people's no, you're smiling. You got that smug look on your face, Mr. Chair. This is a serious topic here. You did not allow for opposition. That is wrong. And it is and this is this is this an informational is hearing. To, this it does not matter. You, do you have a question, the Representative Franzen? The public has a right to know that their gas bills are going to skyrocket. Families should not have to rely on coupons and get upside to fill their gas tank, and you are going to make problems worse. Opposition is needed to be heard so that the citizens of Minnesota can get the full picture of what you and your committee members are pushing. Minnesota families are hurting and you should be ashamed of yourself. Thank you, Representative Franzen. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, I think, you know, if we just want to do a hearing, we could do a press release on a bill like this. I do want to thank you for pulling the bill um, and not having a, a real hearing. You know, I think, you know, it would be pretty darn tough deaf to be moving when we have high fuel prices, we've got families hurting, we had high inflation um, going through the economy um, and just adding more regulation. Um, and, and just a point to what Representative Lippert talked about. He said, you know, we, you know, the goal of this bill is to stop the, the, the warming now. Um, I believe that was his, his, his quote. 
And, you know, we've heard over and over from the science that this bill will do nothing to do any such thing. Um, it will complicate our fuel market. It'll, uh, it'll make the way to do business within interstates. Um, you know, truckers are already buying their fuel in, in Iowa and Wisconsin and South Dakota and skipping over Minnesota. And we have real serious issues when it comes to the cost of fuel. If you want the California fuel standard to be moved to Minnesota, um, you need, need to in, at least engage all parties. And, you know, it seems like those that are willing to benefit and willing to profit, um, whether it's through, you know, their quasi-religious feelings on the environment, um, you know, it's it's a big concern. And I'm, I'm thankful that you did pull it. Um, and so the bill and, probably won't be moving forward. But, uh, like, you know, I think families are hurting. Many. And it's it's not that's because of lack weird. of regulation, <laughs> not because of lack of, of leftist policies. And, uh, you know, we we just really need to think long and hard that these bills don't move forward um, and, and allow common sense to prevail. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Swazinski. That'll have to be our last word because we're out of time. Representative Lippert, would you care to make brief closing remarks? Sure. And uh, just to quickly respond, I think we heard testimony that, um, that this policy is not increasing uh, fuel prices. And I heard similar uh, uh, information as I was talking with Oregon officials as well. Um, and we definitely need to be responding to climate change now, uh, responding to methane emissions now. We heard that from the United Nations in our last climate report. Um, and, you know, farmers and others, all of us are going to be seeing impacts of climate change again this spring and heavy rainfall events. Um, climate is changing now. The impacts are being felt now, and they're going to be felt even more in the future. This is a policy that could be a key tool for us, one among many, uh, but it could be a key piece of the climate puzzle for us in helping us meet our goals and doing our part as a state to be a responsible member of the, of the global community in addressing climate change. So I appreciate the time, uh, Mr. Chair, for this hearing, the time that you've given to this conversation in the, and this work in the interim as well. Um, and I uh, hope this conversation moved um, this effort forward today. Thank you, Representative Lippert. I uh, sincerely appreciate all your stakeholder engagement over this and uh, the many hours that uh, you've spent working with the uh, community to try to get this right. Um, with that, members, we are going to turn to the Department of Commerce's uh, Supplemental Energy Budget presentation. And uh, this is a bill that I will be authoring on behalf of the department, uh, House File 4654. So I will move that House File 4654 be laid over for possible inclusion. And we'll turn to Commissioner Arnold for a presentation of the Commerce Department's budget. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning, Chair Long and members. For the record, I'm Grace Arnold. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Commerce. I have with me today Deputy Commissioner Kevin Lee, who will be providing the bulk of the overview, as well as Assistant Commissioner Catherine Bel Blauvelt and State Energy Office Director Michelle Grancy, uh, all of whom are key members of our team contributing to the budget you see here. I'd also like to acknowledge our Government Affairs Director, John Kelly, who is available for question and answer um, after the follow-up and um, is an excellent team member as well while we get the next slide up. All right, um, so you'll see that we have seven budget proposals in front of you today. The State Competitiveness Fund is at $20 million. That's to um, allow the state to maximize funding from the um, Infra Federal Infrastructure Act that was passed earlier. The Weatherization Assistance Program, we have $58.5 million. Water Utility Resilience at $18 million. Solar for Schools is a program already in place for, and we are adding $3 million to that. There's a decarbonization technology fund that we have $35 million uh, allocated to, that's to invest in early stage technologies. And then grants for renewable integration and demonstration at $5 million a year. And that's uh, scheduled to come from the, or slotted to come from the renewable development account. We also have a green innovation fund at $34 million a year. Overall, these proposals are, the purpose of these proposals is for Minnesotans to have energy that's affordable, reliable, and as much as possible generated in Minnesota. We have a total general fund request of 168.5 million toward these programs and a total renewable development account request of $5 million annually. Um, and so I just wanna note that the grid account base allows up to $15 million annually, depending on the RDA balance and Kevin will get into that later. 
by fiscal year for those who are tracking fiscal year 23 has 149.5 million dollars of investment uh, in the clean energy economy fiscal year 24 has 19 million dollars and fiscal year 25 has 15 million dollars I'm going to turn it over to Kevin now to, to run through the rest of the proposal. I thank you for the time and to the committee for your consideration. Commissioner, uh, Deputy Commissioner Lee, please announce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Long, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Kevin Lee. I am the Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Energy Resources. And I'm very happy to be sharing with you today and the members of the committee, the uh, governor's budget recommendations. Uh, the first item we go that I'm going to be talking about uh, in a little bit of detail is the state competitiveness fund. Uh, this fund is really about seizing opportunities that are presented through the passage of the Federal Infrastructure Act. Uh, it's designed to enhance grid reliability statewide, uh, strengthen businesses and to grow Minnesota jobs uh, by leveraging those federal dollars uh, for infrastructure projects um, in really critical areas. Let's see here. Uh, this fund is designed to position Minnesota in a place where we can successfully compete for these federal DOE uh, programs and, and funding opportunities uh, made available through that act. Um, and in particular, some of the things that we would like to highlight uh, is that a number of these funding opportunities uh, could have a significant impact on rural communities, historically disadvantaged communities, uh, and include specific grant opportunities uh, that are focused on rural and re remote areas, uh, but also that there are competitive opportunities uh, where funding is really needed to uh, prevent grid outages for municipal and cooperatively owned utilities, and also developing energy-related uh, worker training opportunities. What this fund is designed is to position us to compete for a, a number of programs that are being developed rapidly at the Department of Energy. Uh, a lot of these are still getting started. The Department of Energy is going through a staffing up process uh, and we are receiving information uh, on a steady basis. Some of, some of these programs, uh, we are still waiting to get some information on. Uh, some, of, some of them we do have some information on. And, and so uh, 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 these funding opportunities, they, they span both formula grants uh, as well as competitive uh, opportunities. Uh, we're, our, our estimate is that this could require for the rest of the calendar year about seven and a half million or more in matching state funds for, for formula uh, programs, as well as a number of competitive opportunities. We'd also like to highlight the fact that a significant amount of this funding is related to utilities. Uh, the match requirement depends on the size of the utility. And one thing to note here is that it has to be uh, new money. Uh, and so match funding from the state uh, could go a long way toward helping those utilities pursue that competitive funding uh, without having a negative impact on the rate payers uh, be because of that requirement that, that the funds are new. Uh, we need to make sure that that, that doesn't fall on rate payers. And that's where this funding can play a really key role. Uh, and one of the funding opportunities that we'd like to highlight is an, a program that is getting started at the DOE. It's called Re Grid Resilience and Reliability. It's a formula grant uh, project uh, about preventing outages and increasing reliability for the grid. It requires a 15% state, state match requirement. It also directs the DOE to establish this new formula grant, grant program to states, tribal nations, uh, to reduce the impact to the electric grid uh, from extreme weather, make sure that that infrastructure can withstand high winds, flooding, uh, and other natural disasters. The next program that we'd like to talk about is the weatherization assistance program. Uh, our, the, the budget bill here includes 58.5 million to permanently lower home energy bills uh, through weatherization uh, to make homes more energy efficient. So here we're talking about things like storm windows, uh, weather stripping, insulation. Uh, this additional weatherization funding uh, would save money and energy for about 15,000 income eligible Minnesotans. And perhaps most critically, this funding would do things that federal funding can't do. It would address issues that otherwise limit eligible households from being able to access uh, those federal dollars and receiving weatherization services. 
So when you comprehensively weatherize a home, what you're doing is you're, you're permanently lowering those home energy costs uh, on an average of about 20 to 30 percent. So for those Minnesotans who pay up to twice as, as high, pay two times as, as, as much in energy bills uh, compared to an average household, uh, those weatherization opportunities provide a one-time infusion of dollars that has a real lasting impact. And so the goal of this bill is to build on the strong foundation uh, from the success, successful federal program and adding to it more flexible state dollars so that we can serve more people, we can reduce building emissions and address uh, barriers to service. Uh, just to give one example, uh, this proposal would fund what we call pre-weatherization services, um, things like a house having asbestos insulation that would render it uh, ineligible for federal dollars. Uh, it would also fund multifamily weather uh, which would serve more renters across Minnesota. And it would fund a community-based weatherization to target neighborhoods uh, with concentrated areas of poverty or remote communities or tribal nations that, uh, that are too often last to receive uh, services. And the last thing that I would like to note here is that uh, DEED is proposing $8 million in training for clean transportation and weatherization. Uh, $6 million of those training dollars would be dedicated for training to boost Minnesota's weatherization workforce. Uh, so an important uh, connection to note there. The next item we would like to present to you is the Water Utilities Resilience Fund. Uh, this budget request directly targets what is often the largest energy cost for local units of government, and that is water and, and wastewater utilities, which can account for up to 40% of the total energy bill for local governments. So this program would fund feasibility studies and direct demonstration projects to save those local governments money by lowering their energy costs uh, for their aging infrastructure uh, in wastewater and drinking water across the state. And so by providing upfront capital for those studies and, and projects, uh, Minnesotans across the state will really benefit from the planning that makes these critical facilities uh, more cost effective um, and in the end resilient to things like power outages and, and extreme weather. This program is also designed to leverage existing programs at the Department of Commerce, things like uh, the State Energy Program Technical Assistance and Partnerships, uh, which focuses on uh, identifying and implementing uh, low cost improvements to reduce energy consumption at wastewater treatment plants. Um, and then another thing that we're working on right now with the University of Minnesota is an analysis of uh, long duration energy storage system configurations, things like uh, large lithium ion batteries, uh, flow batteries, could be hydrogen or ammonia as energy storage. Uh, and this funding will build on those programs to really target communities that can benefit most from those feasibility studies and demonstration projects uh, in order to support that critical infrastructure. So the second thing that we'd like to highlight here is that not only do these facilities uh, typically cost a fair amount, uh, they are critical infrastructure elements in and of themselves, uh, critical to both public health and uh, and economic development. And so the goal of this proposal is to stimulate the installation of energy technology projects that will make these facilities more resilient to power outages uh, and more able to reduce their over energy demand. So by focusing on each facility and, and we enable uh, a, a focus on the unique needs of each water utility uh, to study them and study among the array of eligible energy technologies, what is the right uh, technology package for that facility. It could be solar PV, it could be combined heat and power. Uh, there's any number of things. And the goal here is to tailor that to each facility uh, for the maximum impact. This program would provide 18 million in fiscal year 2023 as a one-time appropriation uh, available until 2027 uh, and provide that those, those dollars as direct grants to local jurisdictions. The next item up is our Solar for Schools program. This program allows uh, provides funding for schools to install uh, rooftop solar arrays. It also provides really amazing uh, education opportunities uh, for the children that, that go to that school. Um, we have had very high interest in, in this program across the state from school districts, uh, from students, from communities. And, um, 
Uh, we've really been impressed by the the quantity of of, of response uh, and the intensity of re response to this to this program. In the first round that we've gone through, we have received uh, a little over 11 million in requests from school districts, uh, which has exceeded our available funds. And so as a result of those requests, we are on track to award about 7.5 million in grants, which represents projects for 80 schools uh, and 45 school districts across major, greater Minnesota. Uh, right now, there are about uh, 60 school districts with solar energy. And so this would, would put that number up to the point where you're almost doubling the number of school districts uh, that have solar systems installed. So our ask is for 3 million for this program to offer solar energy for these schools and to provide those uh, learning opportunities for those students in clean energy um, going forward. The last items that we have here are all centered around uh, expanding clean energy business businesses in Minnesota. And there are three components to, to, to this. Uh, the first is a decarbonization technology investment fund. The second is a grants for renewable integration and deployment fund. And the last is a green innovation finance phone, uh, fund, uh, also known as a green bank. So to talk about the first, this is based on our belief that Minnesota can and should be a global leader in clean tech. Uh, we rank high in innovation, but we are at risk of losing jobs and businesses to other states. Uh, and so that's why we have proposed creating this technology investment fund uh, with 35 million to provide loans uh, and other financing mechanisms targeted to early stage companies to really catalyze the next generation of clean technology business growth in Minnesota. This is a 10 year fund uh, with an investment committee that would make recommendations on investments and would really position Minnesota to successfully compete and retain clean tech businesses that have proven their technology through R&D and are now in the stage where they are raising capital for uh, early deployment. The grants for renewable integration and demonstration uh, project would stimulate research development and grid integration uh, for electric energy technologies and encourage grid modernization. So this could include projects that would implement energy storage. Uh, it could be load control and management. It could be smart meter technology. Um, and this would also stimulate other innovative energy projects uh, that reduce demand and overall increase system uh, efficiency and reliability. Just as an example, uh, one thing this program might do is, is spur applications around long duration energy storage, something that we're seeing as uh, very critical uh, to expanding the grid um, as renewable penetrations get higher. Uh, it, it could include green hydrogen and, and ammonia as those long-term energy storage options uh, or proposals to enable the integration of renewable electric energy technologies uh, to support uh, enhanced grid operation. Um, so uh, this process is designed to create a predictable and transparent process to administer renewable development account funds. Uh, it would support the deployment and commercialization of emerging and renewable technologies uh, while building out uh, grid flexibility and resilience. It would be designed uh, for 5 million annually. Uh, it would also include the opportunity to expand up to 10 million uh, annually if RDA funds uh, are remaining each year after other legislative appropriations uh, were complete. We are anticipating that this would involve grant awards of, of roughly in the neighborhood of 250000 for a three-year grant, uh, meaning that this proposal would fund about 18 projects uh, each year. The last request and proposal we'd like to talk about is the Green Innovation Fund, uh, also called the Green Bank. Um, there's a number of reasons why a green, clean energy project that would benefit a farmer or a business or a community or an individual, uh, but doesn't move forward uh, through conventional financing. Um, that could be because lending terms are not favorable. Uh, it could be because of you know, high interest rates. Um, 
In other cases, there may just be a gap in financing where private financing is able to finance a, a, a subcomponent of the project, but is not able to provide the complete financing. And so uh, this is designed to fill those gaps. Uh, it can enable projects and lending to certain sectors by working in tandem with existing state programs uh, and private and nonprofit lenders to address those financing gaps uh, and unlock capital for, for those underserved sectors. So, so this slide just gives you a little bit of a snapshot of how a green bank works. Uh, in general, as you can see, the overall idea is to really catalyze private investment. Uh, our proposal would establish an advisory task force made up of uh, a number of entities with a range of experiences to, to guide investments. Uh, it would create the Green Innovation Finance Fund as a nonprofit 501c3 organization uh, governed by a board of directors. And the initial board would have uh, a majority of those task force members as board directors. Uh, and it also provides some provisions for the Department of Commerce to provide some oversight as well. The Green Bank essentially seeks to partner with private lenders and other lending programs, uh, as well as utilities. It would serve areas in clean energy and energy efficiency, uh, electrification. It could also include regenerative agriculture, uh, clean water, energy or climate resilience, uh, and really prioritize projects that maximize greenhouse gas emissions reductions, uh, as well as addressing disparities in access to clean energy projects uh, for underserved communities. Uh, within those areas, the Green Bank will identify underserved markets uh, and develop programs to overcome those barriers to ensure that uh, there is a higher level of private and public funding uh, to leverage other public and private sources of capital and, uh, and to serve as, as an informational resource uh, to contractors. And finally, I would note that projects over 100,000 financed uh, all or in part by the Green Bank uh, will ensure that workers are paid prevailing wages. And so with that, uh, I and my team are available to answer any questions that you may have on our 2022 energy budget bill. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, we have two individuals who signed up for public testimony. If they could keep their testimony very brief, I would appreciate it so we can uh, get to questions. And first, we will hear from Nina Axelson. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning, Chair Long and committee members. For the record, my name is Nina Axelson, and I am the founder of Grid Catalyst. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today to provide testimony in support of the Supplemental Energy Budget for the Minnesota Department of Commerce and specifically section seven of the bill regarding grants for renewable integration and demonstration or GRID for short. I found a GRID catalyst in 2021 after having spent nearly 20 years working in the energy industry, most recently as the vice president of sustainability for a local utility. A major driver for me in founding GRID catalyst was my experiences and frankly frustration when it came to developing and implementing innovative and new to market technologies as much as progress as we have made in creating market pathways for competitive and decarbonizing technologies and solutions, there are still too many barriers for entrepreneurs and startups with game-changing ideas. There are tangible risks to these earlier stage innovations and they need to be managed, reliability, cost-effectiveness, and technical and financial feasibility. However, Minnesota lacks robust programs available in other states and regions to address these risks and create a functional opportunity to test, refine, and launch big ideas that establish investment opportunities, new businesses, jobs, and drive solutions for industries and customers that we need. For our accelerator program, we are addressing these risks by working in partnership with regional leaders in business, utility, government, nonprofit, and higher education, who need these emerging technologies and approaches to be efficient and competitive nationally and globally. Together, we are supporting entrepreneurs and startups to demonstrate and accelerate their big ideas and practical solutions to make our energy system more resilient to achieve urgent decarbonization objectives. Through our program and other regional efforts, we have the opportunity to make Minnesota a Northern Climate Technology Hub, attracting and growing more startups and the investments to help them scale. I'd like to thank Chair Long and committee members for your leadership and helping transform Minnesota's energy system to one that is cleaner, more affordable and reliable. The supplemental energy budget for the department that is before you provides an important opportunity to help achieve and accelerate progress towards these outcomes and will benefit all Minnesotans. 
In particular, the Grants for Renewable Integration and Demonstration, or GRID, will provide crucial incentives and support for innovators like those that I work with through our program. GRID will help de-risk the path for technology commercialization by providing direct financial support for development and deployment of solutions that will make our energy system more efficient, modern, and secure. Funding GRID also sends a clear market and policy signal that delivers value to private sector efforts and will help attract additional investment and further market development, which is great for our region. In closing, I respectfully ask for your support of the department's supplemental energy budget and GRID program. As our energy system transforms, this will competitively position Minnesota as a leader in the fast growing market for energy innovation, solutions, and deployment. Will also help our state create more jobs and seize the economic development opportunities that this presents. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Ms. Axelson. Uh, our second testifier has uh, opted to testify next week, so we will move to member questions, and we'll start with Representative Grunhagen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Representative Greenhagen. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, you know, one of the things I got a question about the governor's budget, you know, one of the things I've been reading from uh, some articles on different experts is that, you know, these batteries, the solar gardens, the windmills, they're going to be an economic disaster to clean up when we have to replace them. Is there anything in the governor's budget to address this uh, in the future? I mean, they've got harsh chemicals in there. The batteries leak. Uh, you know, I've got at least uh, three articles by experts saying that doomsday is coming. We got to replace these down the road. Uh, any response on that? I got a follow up question. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Lee. The Chair Long, Representative Greenhagen. Uh, that's a great question. The Department of Energy, one of the programs that they are in the process of building out and staffing up <clears throat> is dedicated to uh, battery manufacturing and recycling. Um, I believe that the details on that program are still forthcoming, so I, I, I don't have um, much more details to share with you, uh, but I do know that that is one of the programs that, that they are working on um, and so is, is one of their priorities, yes. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for that response. But what about windmills and solar? I mean, they're going to be an environmental disaster. I, you know, they're bearing the uh, uh, windmill uh, ones that are have to be replaced into the ground. They got no place to recycle them. Do you have any response uh, to that, uh, to those concerns by certain experts? Deputy Commissioner Lee. Chair Long, Representative Greenhagen. I don't believe that any of the programs uh, that the DOE is building out, well, I, I shouldn't say don't believe. I, to my knowledge, they don't address decommissioning from, from solar and wind. Um, I could, perhaps one of my colleagues will correct me on that. Um, I will say that, that uh, decommissioning uh, of both solar and wind facilities is something that, um, that we do work on uh, with the Public Utilities Commission, with utilities. Um, and so to the extent that you have um, other details you'd like to share, we, we would love to um, hear about it and, and chat more. It's, it's an issue that uh, sort of permeates our work um, across, across the department. Representative Lee. Uh, Representative Greenhagen, we're going to have to keep moving. Sorry, we just got Yeah, just one there. comment is that Very CO2 brief. is not a problem. It's not a greenhouse gas. And to suggest it is, is completely anti-science, according to 31,000 uh, U.S. scientists, some with 9,000 with PhDs. Please correct your comments. Thank you. I've, I've never heard a scientist say CO2 is not a greenhouse gas, but Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the Department of Commerce. I just have a question regarding the... Uh, Section two, the water utility uh, energy resilience program uh, for commerce on line 9.18 and line 9.19. Can you tell us who are these wastewater and water utility? Are they the same uh, folks or entity that are coming to capital investment asking for water infrastructure dollars? Deputy Commissioner Lee or Mr. Kelly? Deputy Commissioner. Uh, Chair Long, I, I was just about to uh, see heard, heard of Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly. Um, I don't want to speculate on that, Chair. I believe we got that uh, term when we were collaborating with PFA Indeed, but we can follow up with you on that. Representative Lee. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Kelly. I think it'll be good to get that clarification to see if these water utilities and also the uh, wastewater definition are these entities that are coming to capital investment for dollars. And Mr. Chair, I think that it is relevant and in, uh, in the sense that under you know the space uh, sustainable building guidelines, uh, water and wastewater facilities are exempted from having a pre-design that will have to go through you know the sustainable building guidelines. And under sustainable building guidelines, we require them to look at the long-term operating costs of the buildings and including looking at renewable energy. And so if we already have this in statute, but we're exempting these folks from uh, abiding by some of our state statute, but now putting uh, money forward, I, I don't disagree with you know having projects that are energy efficient, but why are we exempting them and then giving them money? And so I just wanted to make sure that we are on the same page as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Lee. Uh, can I just uh, chair? Mr. Kelly, real briefly, yep. So the PFA does not fund feasibility studies. So th this is this is meant to coordinate. This is meant to be in coordination with these local units of government, so that they can see these types of projects that they need. We're we're not trying to be duplicative, but we're happy to follow up with you, Chair, um, offline. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, Representative Swasinski, I'll let you sneak in the last question since we're we're at time, and we will have Commerce back uh, next week for additional questions if, if we have them on the budget presentation. Representative Swazinski. Just a quick question, uh, just with the Russia stuff going on, um, this would be the, the to the Commerce the Commissioner. Um, is there, with the resilience, resiliency uh, portion, does any of that look at the EMP potential effects or our resiliency against that? Um, just, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal about that, just a general question. Deputy Commissioner Lee. Chair Long, uh, Representative Spadzinski, uh, if I'm understanding your question right, um, it could potentially do that. So an example of what a project like this could look like would be having some uh, on-site electricity storage, which would provide ongoing energy in the event of an outage. And that outage could be from, from any source. It could be from weather or, or some other source. So to the extent that there's an outage that affects one of these facilities, uh, a energy storage project could assist with that, yes. So we'll have to leave it there for now, but as I mentioned, uh, the Department of Commerce, uh, I'll ask them to, to come back for our budget, uh, full budget presentation next week when we are marking up our budget if there are further questions. Uh, thank you for a good hearing today, members. We're adjourned.